Accidents, just because they're unintentional, doesn't make them any less deadly. Schools are supposed to be safe environments for children to learn and however tragedy does have a way of sneaking in. It was March 4th, 1908 when the lives of numerous families around Collinwood, Ohio were torn apart. Collinwood back at this time was a community that since has become a neighborhood in the city of Cleveland. It was also home to Collinwood School, also known as Lakeview School, a four-story building which housed hundreds of students. Little did parents or the children who attended this school know that on that cold day in early March, they would become part of an event that would initiate safer standards for schools across the entire country. But this beneficial change would come at a devastating cost. It was early morning and hundreds of students had assembled in their classrooms. A sizable furnace in the basement of the school was raging hot, necessary to heat the large building through the freezing winter months. Though the outside of the school was made of load-bearing masonry, much of the structural aspects of the school's floors were composed of wooden joists. The floors supported by these joists were always well-oiled throughout the entire building, from hallways to classrooms. Combined with the startling fact that the main stairway in the school, which extended from the front door to the third floor, had not a single fire door on it, was a recipe for disaster. Just before 9 a.m., the furnace began to overheat, and as a result, nearby exposed wood began to scorch. The flammable structure rapidly caught fire and the fire began tearing up through the floors and engulfing everything it could reach. The large amount of wood and oiled floors fueled the fire exponentially and soon classrooms became overwhelmed with smoke. The children panicked while teachers attempted to maintain order. By the time most people realized there was a fire, it was too late to escape it as exits were blocked within minutes by the relentless, furious inferno. Students flooded into the stairwell, attempting to escape in a panic. Students clashed into one another as children from below tried to climb the stairs in search for a way out, while students from the upper levels ran down. The stairwell acted as a chimney and choked anyone inside. Those not caught in the stairwell were pressed and trapped against doors that were either locked or only able to be opened inwardly. As the school continued to burn more and more, students became desperate. Children trapped on the upper floor started opening windows and jumping out, oftentimes to their certain death when they collided with the cold, unflinching ground below. What seemed like only moments after the fire was set on its destructive course, children inside began to die. Smoke filled their small lungs and stole their lives. Some weren't so fortunate to die from smoke inhalation as the flames licked their bodies, engulfing their clothing and burning them to death. Those gathered outside, which included a large group of students who managed to escape in time and other members of the community, looked on in horror, helplessly, hearing the children's desperate screams muffled by the roaring flames and snapping wood. One nine-year-old student who happened to escape searched the crowd for his younger brother. When he found his brother wasn't among those who made it out safely, he bravely ran back into the school to find him. Neither brother made it out. After the fire had finally been extinguished, the fire department examined the ruins and found 172 dead children. Some of them were burned beyond recognition. Altogether, 175 people died that day. On top of the 172 students, two teachers and one rescuer perished in the massive fire. For what felt like an eternity afterwards, the streets were filled with carriages carrying the dead as the entire village mourned. The tremendous loss of life initiated better fire safety protocols to be installed in schools across the country. The school has undergone many changes over the years since, but was renamed to Memorial Elementary in 2005 and is still in use to this day. You might want to take a deep breath for what's next.
London in early December of 1952 was not a place you would have liked to be living. It was especially cold, which really wasn't out of the ordinary, but in order to keep warm, London residents were burning an exceptional amount of coal. Post-war domestic coal in this time period wasn't the highest grade quality either. It was considered to be low grade and highly sulfurous. This means when burnt, it produced more sulfur dioxide, a toxic gas. Aside from residents burning the coal, there were numerous coal-fired power stations in the greater London area also burning away. This could all be considered normal, but then suddenly the weather changed, and so did everything else. Bizarre weather conditions aligned perfectly and ended up leading to disaster. As if the coal didn't produce enough pollution on its own, more pollutants from steam locomotives and diesel buses pumped into the air, along with winds blowing heavily polluted air across the English Channel from industrial areas of continental Europe. All of these things came together in a perfect storm of sorts. Incredibly cold weather combined with an anti-cyclone and windless conditions collected all of the airborne pollutants and formed it into a heavy blanket that covered the city and invaded residents' homes. This thick, cold, stagnant air was trapped under a layer of warm air above. This incredibly toxic gas contained particles of soot and created a yellow-black haze over everything. With no source of any significant wind, the smog was locked in place and simply continued to thicken as chimneys and other sources of pollution continued to pour into the air. London residents are no strangers to thick fog, but this fog had a visibility reduced to the point that you felt you were nearly blind at times. Transportation was rendered nearly impossible, which included the ambulance service, meaning that people who became ill or injured needed to transport themselves to the hospital, however they could manage in the thick smog. It became so bad that people who would leave their homes would need to shuffle their feet in front of them and feel around to be sure they didn't misstep and fall. But what seemed to be just a terrible annoyance turned out to be something else entirely. No one seemed to get too distressed over the fog. Fog was normal. Perhaps this was worse than usual, but still it was believed to be nothing to get too worried over. And then suddenly, people began to die. The very young and the elderly, or those with respiratory conditions already, were at a greater risk and began dropping one by one, the smog choking them to death. More and more people as time went on continued to die with even more reporting their illnesses. Respiratory infections and hypoxia developed and pus obstructed the air passages of the lungs. When all was said and done, an estimated 12,000 people were dead, with hundreds of thousands of people impacted by varying degrees of illness. This event inspired a closer and more careful approach to air pollution, but even with new protocols in place, another toxic fog swept over London again a decade later. But fortunately, it wasn't nearly as bad as what will be known forever as the Great Smog of 52. Like many during this time, the city of Halifax in Nova Scotia, Canada was fully embroiled in the First World War. Although it was a time of global hardship, the thriving city of 60,000 was quickly consumed in the constant coming and going of troops, merchant vessels, and sailors that were departing for service in Europe. The East Shore community of Dartmouth was considered to be one of the British Royal Navy's most important bases in North America, and because of the high demand for workers, many citizens flocked to Halifax for employment and residential opportunities. The Halifax Harbor was considered to be a vital point for trade and resources, however this would drastically change. French munition ship the SS Mont Blanc left New York December 1st and was intended to join a convoy in Halifax that would depart for Europe. The SS Mont Blanc had departed New York with an abundance of explosives, heavily loaded with TNT and benzol to name a few. Carrying nearly 3,000 tons of dangerous cargo concerned the harbor pilot Francis Mackey. Francis requested additional precautions to be made such as a guard ship, however protection wasn't provided. Unfortunate history was made on the busy winter morning of December 6, 1917, when Francis noticed the SS Emo, a Norwegian vessel approaching the ship at high speeds. It had been noted that the SS Emo was passing into the left of oncoming ships instead of staying in the right lane, which was customary. The ship was traveling at such a high speed because of the delay it had experienced when loading cargo, and the crew was attempting to make up for lost time. 
Better late than never would be a valuable lesson, unfortunately lost on the crew that day. Francis noticed the rushing ship approaching the position of his own ship and promptly blasted the ship's whistle to indicate to the SS Emo that he had the right of way. The SS Emo, still in a frantic rush, blasted two whistles back, indicating that it would not yield for the Mont Blanc and was on course to cut the ship off. Francis ordered the engines halted and again blasted its whistle, but was met again with a stubborn double blast from the SS Emo. Sailors nearby gathered, knowing something wasn't right, and the two ships were very possibly going to collide, if they had only known what was to result from the collision. The SS Emo eventually cut its engines, but it was too late. Their momentum eventually clashed the two ships together at slow speeds, and they ended up on top of one another. Flammable contents on the Mont Blanc broke open and spilled onto the deck and into the hold. The SS Emo, in an attempt to separate, fired up their engines to reverse. This created a spark that quickly lit the Mont Blanc on fire. Thick black smoke rapidly consumed the area, and Francis, in a state of monumental fear over the contents of his ship exploding, ordered the crew to abandon ship. Though people tried to assist in controlling the fire, it was no use. Residents in nearby homes gathered at the windows to watch the flaming ship as it continued to drift, abandoned. This would prove to be a mistake. Around 20 minutes after the collision, the raging fires finally ignited the highly explosive cargo aboard the ship. The ship was entirely blown apart in one of the worst accidental explosions in history. It was so powerful and bright that residents looking out their windows were immediately blinded by the flash. The blast wave radiated from the explosion at more than 1,000 meters or 3,300 feet per second. At the center of the explosion, temperatures exceeded 5,000 degrees Celsius or 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit and was accompanied by pressure in the thousands of atmospheres. Deadly shards of iron, white hot, rained down from the sky on Dartmouth and Halifax. The shockwave from the event traveled through the earth at around 23 times the speed of sound and was clearly felt by residents of Cape Breton, located 207 kilometers or 129 miles away. Over 1,600 people were killed instantly, and around 9,000 people were injured, resulting in over 300 further deaths after the event which numbered over 12,000 were either outright destroyed or badly damaged. Even brick and stone factories near the site were blown into piles of rubble. The explosion was so great it even created a tsunami which crushed and killed numerous people in its path. Bodies hung out of windows dead, some people's heads were blown completely off, even the telegraph wires overhead had dead, mangled bodies caught and wrapped up in them. All in all, nearly 2,000 people lost their lives that terrible morning, and the surrounding areas were changed forever. A sobering reminder that humanity can often underestimate the impact of its own advances. Despite the tragic loss of life, only one crew member from the Mont Blanc died in the event. Thank you for watching. Before we go, I'd like to give a very special shout out to Audible. The wonderful people at Audible are big fans of Seriously Strange and have graciously decided to support this episode. Audible is the leading provider of audiobooks with over 150,000 titles to choose from, and they're offering Seriously Strange viewers a free 30-day trial to try out their incredible service. All you need to do is go to audible.com slash rob to start your 30-day free trial. I'm currently listening to Weird Life, the search for life that is very, very different from our own. This audiobook dives into the remarkably bizarre lives of other life forms, lives that defy what we consider to be survivable. It's sure to blow your mind, but I won't spoil it for you. If you want to listen to something else, that's no problem. Audible has plenty of other genres to choose from, from mystery to business to comedy and much, much more. All you need to do is go to audible.com slash rob, start your 30-day free trial, listen anywhere you want, and expand your mind. Thanks for listening. If you would like to learn more dark and disturbing topics, please be sure to subscribe to my channel now. And also be sure to head back to my channel on Friday for the first episode of my brand new series, Question Everything. And I will see you then.